Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas on how to lead your church into the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Now, here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. Today, Martha Tatarnik again welcomes Alexander Lang to the show. Martha had a great episode with him back in season 14. We'll put a link in the show notes. Alex is a former PCUSA pastor who worked in church ministry for 20 years. He has since left the church to pursue a technology business that is designed to help people form meaningful relationships. Alex's interests include independent film, electronic music, and deep conversation with people who question, doubt, and want to dig into the most complex issues we face as humans. When he's not working on books, podcasts, or the restorative faith movement, Alex enjoys spending time with his wife and two sons. One more thing. Please take a moment to leave a review on whatever podcast app you're listening on and share this episode with a friend. Thanks, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. I am your guest host, Martha Tatarnik, and I'm so pleased to be joined by the Reverend Alexander Lang for a return conversation on the Future Christian Podcast. Welcome, Alex. It is great to talk to you again. Oh, thank you for having me on again. It's, it's wonderful. This is a great podcast. Well, thank you. Um, now, the last time that we spoke, it was a couple of months ago, and you had written an article that went viral on um, why you decided to leave congregational pastoral ministry. So I think that was like the end of the summer of 2023 that you left your post as a lead pastor at the church where you were serving and wrote an article that hundreds of thousands of us read. And uh, we talked about that article and uh, all of the thought that went into that decision. Um, can we just start by checking in about how the last five or six months have been going since you stepped out of that role? Yeah, I've been doing well. I haven't been going through like withdrawal symptoms or anything like that for not being nope. in a church. <laughs> so, so I, and I actually, to be perfectly honest with you, um, I haven't been to church for a long time. I went to church for the first time on Christmas Eve uh, because my sons were part of the service. And so it was really nice to be there because uh, I realized that I didn't have to stress about the details of what was going on. And I thought to myself, oh, this is why people actually like going to church because <laughs> you can just kind of like take it all in and enjoy it. And I didn't have to worry about, you know, uh, whether or not you know, everything was going to come off properly. So it was a really very enjoyable experience to go back and uh, and to see my sons and to just be part of a service again. Well, I think that that probably says a number of things about your personality that are probably all um, pretty commendable, because I'm not sure that everybody who is a former pastor would be able to just sit back and relax and not stress about the details or be super judgmental or whatever. So good for you. I'm glad it was <laughs> an enjoyable experience. It was That's a good time. Good. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm kind of wondering, like, stepping outside of um, that leadership role in the church now for a number of months, like, it must change your perspective on what the life of the church is all about right now in the year 2024. Like, it must be a different vantage point to consider the present and the future of the church when you're not, like, mired in the day-to-day -day details. Like, what has that been like? Yeah, you know, it's I've actually, in being away, because I think I couldn't have appreciated this while I was in the midst of it, but what I see now, having come away from it, 
is that one of the largest dearths to my everyday life is actually not being around that community in the church that I was there with week in and week out. Um, and I see friends and everything, but I'm mostly, you know, I, I'm doing my own things and I'm spending time by myself. And I thought to myself at one point, I was like, oh, this is how a lot of people live, where they mm-hmm. don't have access to a large community of people that they see all the time. And, you know, to me, it kind of led to a takeaway, which is that there's this feeling that you, like, I realized, wow, not being in close proximity to those folks makes me feel like I'm missing something, which I don't think if I hadn't been there, I would have known I was missing. So if you've never been there, you don't know what you're missing. But I do see it as now that I'm kind of, and, you know, we talked about this, the institutional church is dying. And so what I realize is that this type of community will not exist the same way in our society because there's no substitute. And so mm-hmm. that's very scary to me because what I realize is that if there's no place where people go and know that they can regularly gather together, I think that's going to have a huge impact on our well-being, our mental well-being, and our sense of loneliness. I think it's only going to cause the loneliness epidemic to increase, unfortunately. So those are kind of some of the takeaways that I've seen from just being away right now and realizing, oh, gosh, that that has an impact on me. And I've only been away for five months. I can't imagine how other people are living. Yeah, that is fascinating. And um, and really, like, I think puts the finger on an important pulse because I I really don't have any experience of living apart from being part of a community like the church. And um, I think that insight that if you've never been part of it, you don't know what you're missing is really important. I mean, we live in this hyper-engaged world that is nonetheless so very lonely. Um, yeah, isn't yeah. that a paradox that we kind yeah. of exist in this place that's so hyper-connected, like you're saying, and yet at the same time, loneliness is at the greatest, uh, you know, statistically, it's the highest it's ever been, at least in, uh, you know, industrialized nations. Uh, I think it's it says a lot about kind of where we are as a as a society, that we need those structures. As much as people have rejected them, we really need them. And uh, we're just seeing kind of, I think, the outlet of where it goes when we don't have those things at the ready and people aren't utilizing them in the way that they used to and kind of what happens with that. So it's sad to me. And, you know, I, I'm i hoping that there'll be some other places where people will gather, but, you know, only time will tell with that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are like a number of other significant deficits that are very much connected to that and um, that provide for the well-being of society as a whole, whether we're talking about charitable giving, whether we're talking about charitable giving of like time and talent, money, um, you know, sort of so many of the, the pieces that fill in the social safety net. They're very connected to that, uh, that faith community gathering very connected anyway not to uh take us down tangents before we get to the the (laughs) real topic for today but i i find that insight um really important so thank you alex um so yeah we're we're here today um to check in for sure but primarily to talk about this beautiful book that is called Restorative Beauty, Spirituality for the 21st Century Rationalist. I'm just going to say at the outset that I read this um, on the Christmas break, and it is just chock full of uh, amazingly accessible scientific insight, but also just like so many powerful stories. It's uh, it's a real page turner, and I highly commend it to our listeners. I'm excited to get into some of the meat with with you today, Alex, um, as we delve into it. So why don't we start by you sharing a little bit about what motivated you to write this book? Yeah, so I've always consider myself a spiritual person. I mean, it's part of the reason why I became a pastor. 
But what became clear to me the longer I remained in the church is that spirituality is kind of a catch-all term. You know, Mm. it's very amorphous. Everybody has their own idea of what spirituality means and what it doesn't. And so depending on your religion, how you were raised, your experiences of the world, that word spirituality is going to mean different things to different people. So the question I set out to answer was, What exactly is happening when humans claim to have a spiritual experience? So yes, I think these spiritual experiences, they all happen in like different contexts and under different circumstances. But is there like a unifying factor that we could point to and say, fundamentally, this is the thing that we're all experiencing? So this is what I kind of set out to explore in the book. This is kind of what I, this is why it's, this is where I started. This is my starting point. That was like your instigating question. That was what you personally wanted to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So that takes us right into, um, I think, kind of a central uh, offering of the book, which is a story about Edgar Mitchell and uh, the naming of the overview effect. And that ultimately becomes the way that you define spirituality throughout the book. So maybe you can get into Edgar and the overview effect so that we have a sense of how you're defining that. Sure. It's an amazing story, actually. And um, I read it a number of years ago, but Edgar Mitchell, he was an astronaut who was part of the Apollo 14 space mission. And like all of the Apollo space missions, there are actually three astronauts on board. So uh, he was together with Alan Shepard and Stuart Rusa. Only two of them got to go down and actually walk on the moon. Uh, and Edgar Mitchell was one of those. The other one had to stay up and, and kind of wait for them to do their mission and come back. But after they performed their mission, they were kind of on their way home. And what's interesting is that because they're kind of shooting through space, the sun, it's it can bake one side of the spacecraft if it's too uh if it stays in one place. So they rotate the craft, they call it barbecue mode. So it rotates in such a way that one side doesn't get too hot. And so because these guys had finished their job, they had essentially done what they had come there to do, they could just sit back and relax. And what would happen is as the spacecraft would rotate, you could look out the window and it would reveal this beautiful panorama of the Earth, the moon, the stars of the Milky Way galaxy. And these three men, they all sat and they watched this for hours. They would just kind of come and they would see it go. And eventually, you know, Alan Shepard and Stuart Russo, they retreated into other activities. But Edgar Mitchell he was transfixed by the scene and he would see the earth and he would think of his brother who was down in Vietnam flying bombing missions. And he himself had actually flown bombing missions in the Korean war. And so it was this kind of cognitive dissonance that was happening in his mind. He was looking at the earth and it looked so peaceful. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, he knew on the surface, it was extraordinarily violent And so what happened was as he was kind of going through back and forth, like the peaceful look of the earth from space, the violence on the surface, something happened to him. And Mitchell, he had this moment where he realized that everything he believed that was true about the world, he realized he was wrong about. So Mitchell had been an avowed atheist for for quite quite some time, most of his life, actually. And he had adopted a wholly scientific view of the world, and he dismissed religion as being outdated, archaic. And that's because, to him, science was very predictable. The universe was very predictable. I mean, how did he get to space? He got to space because, right, like, science shot him there. Math got him there. And that's why he was able to come home safely. But when he looked out that window, he realized that there was something very deficient in his perspective. And so he felt something that he had never felt before. And as he looked at the earth, moon, and stars, they no longer felt like they were these separate, distinct bodies that were floating in the middle of space. He wasn't an observer of these bodies, but rather they were part of him. He felt connected Mm. to them. And he used this, this really interesting, he said, he said, it felt like his flesh and bones disappeared. And there were no boundaries between his body and the celestial bodies. Hmm. And so he was living as though in that moment, he experienced life with no distinctions at all. Everything was one. Hmm. 
And so Mitchell described this event, he called it an ecstasy of unity. And in that moment, he ends up abandoning his atheism. And he didn't, I don't think he ever said he believed in a God, but he definitely believed that there was a force that was more powerful than any religion or scientific principle had ever described that kind of created or is responsible for the universe. And he was the first person to kind of come back and talk about this. He dedicated his life to it. And this experience became known as the overview effect because it was actually, he's not the only person to have this. A number of uh, astronauts had experienced this. And um, it's the idea, the reason why it's called the overview effect is because when you get an overview of the earth, like you gain this perspective that you could never have when you're here on the surface of the planet. And almost every astronaut who has been through this, they talk about how it fundamentally changes their understanding of existence. So after I read this, this story, I asked myself a question. What exactly is happening when these astronauts experience the overview effect? Like, why? what does Edgar Mitchell mean by the ecstasy of unity? And so even though Mitchell was an atheist, right? Like, to me, I read that and I was like, it sounds like he's talking about the way mystics describe their spiritual experiences. Yeah, like, if you yeah. read those spiritual experiences, you're like, oh my gosh, it's like he's talking about the same thing. And so for, for they say, like, uh, like, if you read like Mr. Meister Eckhart or um, or any of these other mystics, they'll talk about how their body melts away mm-hmm. and the membrane that separates them from the rest of the world effectively disappears and everything becomes one. So I began to wonder if this atheist who is completely separated from any religious identity can have an experience like this, is his experience somehow at the core of spirituality for everyone? Right. So that's kind of where it all started, was with that story. Okay. All right. So that's the overview effect. I'm curious, like, you talk about it fundamentally shifting his understanding of the world. Like, was there also a shift in action, a shift in kind of how he lived his how life? How he lived his life? Absolutely. So he came back and, um, you know, he, he when he basically would go around the country from this point forward and everything he did with his life was he had pictures he had taken from space and he would tell people about this event. Like he would tell people what happened and it became, he became so well known for this that, um, and, and he, and he really was fighting against war and he's like, he says, we don't need to fight anymore. And people, when they would hear this, what happened was he, uh, he talked about that basically they believed that if everybody could get into space, then we would get rid of all war, all suffering, all poverty. It would all go away because we would all understand how we're all connected to each other and we would see no need to have these divisive fights. So for him, it really did change his life. And he really, he really believed, I mean, it's, it's frankly very Christian the way that he talks about it. This, I mean, it's, it's the way Jesus describes the kingdom is exactly what he's talking about, but he doesn't use any of that language. But that's the experience that it forced on him or that it caused him to see the world that way. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate that that piece of it because it isn't merely about like individuals having a cool experience or like a reorientation of our our minds and our souls. It's it's fundamentally a response to kind of the biggest questions and concerns of of our human race right like it's it's a response to poverty it's a response to global warming it's a response to war it's um yeah yeah and and i think that there's and i think this is why spirituality for me has always been about i i think i always related to that as kind of the central core of what spirituality is is the relation to the other Mm -hmm. no like feeling that we are connected to each other and i know that a lot of people don't define spirituality that way but for me that has always been the key component of every spiritual experience i've had and so that's why when i read this it felt to me like oh my gosh this is wonderful because it allows you to put into practice teachings 
like, you know, we have these teachings from Jesus that really press us to live in such a way that we're divesting of ourselves and living for the benefit of everyone else. We're thinking of community all the time, but you can't really do that unless you feel this connection. And that's why spirituality like this becomes so critically important, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I want to talk about the title, Spirituality for the 21st Century Rationalist. I was uh, saying before we began recording that I had somebody in my office earlier today, and I really had to convince him not to walk out with the book because um, I said he could borrow it after we did the interview. But, you know, he saw that title and just felt like, okay, this is a book for me. I'm a 21st century rationalist. Um, As I mentioned at the outset, there's some really high level analysis about what science currently teaches us about evolution, about life in this universe, about the start of life in this universe, about the possibility of other intelligent life in this universe, about consciousness. Um, I think that uh, as writers, we we start with writing what we need to read ourselves. And you kind of said that. You started with a question that you wanted to explore. But but we really hope that also we're um, writing something that others need to read as well. So I'm wondering um, what your experience has been, especially in pastoral ministry in the past, uh, what your experience has been of that spiritual need of the 21st century, 21st century rationalist. Like, why is the book needed for, for them? Yeah. So, I mean, you like me, um, you know, I, I came of age in the 1980s and 1990s, and I vividly remember how much I enjoyed my science classes. So I love learning about earth science and DNA and cells and evolution. And even though, like you, I didn't pursue science as a profession, um, it's always been the basis of my understanding of reality. Yeah, And so the scientific method, I don't know about you, but for me, the scientific method is like a critical part of my thinking, which is the idea is that you approach everything with kind of a skeptical mind and you require proof for your assertions. Yeah, And I think for millennials and the generations after us, uh, this is a pretty common way to think because of our education. Um, and so this mentality, it really is associated with modern rationalism, which means that the older ways of explaining how the world functions, like we find in a religious text, uh, they're often called into question. So, for example, and a simple one would be, we know today that the reason why someone gets sick is not because there's an evil spirit or a demon possessing them. It's because they have a bacterial or a viral infection. Uh, the reason why someone has a seizure and uh, is not because Satan wants to mm. throw them on a fire and kill them, but because there's they have something genetic going on with their brains that cause electrical activity to cross uh, to hemispheres. And so, you know, when we see this, I think a lot of younger people, because we we know these things, and we and we're very fortunate. You think about the world we live in; everything we know. Well, when they when they learn all this stuff in school, and then they're exposed to religious explanations for how the world functions, it kind of feels super antiquated and out of date, right? And so, they, just take the sickness thing. If they're like the biblical explanation for sickness is so off base. How, like if they're sitting there and looking at that, they're like, well, how can we trust the rest of it? Right? Yeah. They were so wrong about that. And now we know what it is. So you have two choices. Like this is the, the modern rationalist is faced with two choices. You can embrace religion and just toss out all the stuff that doesn't work for you. Or rather than attempt to mesh these two worlds together, they simply stick with their scientific view and ignore the religious and assume it's just irrelevant. Right. Yeah. So those are, those are kind of like your two options. I think that most people have. So, but yet at the same time, here's the interesting thing, right? In spite of being scientifically minded, many of those same people who reject religion completely, they still feel a certain spiritual connection to the world around them. And they know that exploring that connection, they kind of know it intuitively. If they explore that connection, that it's going to lead to a more meaningful and fulfilling existence. But the problem is they've already rejected religion. And without religion, where do they start that spiritual journey? So there's this tension that exists where people, they feel like they don't want to let go of those rational sentiments. 
to embrace their spirituality, but they also know intuitively that there's something more to life than what rationalism offers. So they find themselves in this really odd space where they feel like there's really nothing for them. And that's why I wrote the book, because, you know, I think whether you're inside or outside of religion, I think a lot of people today need a middle path to spirituality. And no one I don't, in, in my reading, no one's really provided that in light of newer scientific discovery, like where we are today. And that's a, that's a big reason why I thought this was important for where we are today. Yeah, you know, I can just share anecdotally, like, I remember very clearly being around the age of like 17, maybe 16 or 17. And I had already felt pretty clearly that uh, that I was called to be a priest in the church. So I was on that track. But I was also like, really having to come to terms with the inherited faith that I had um, in light of, you know, the questions that were raised by my ongoing education. And in a, in a lot of ways, those, those questions and doubts and wonderings never stopped, you know, like they, they continued throughout, uh, well, you know, well, how did, that's you, a how did you deal with that tension? I'm interested well, to know like how you would deal with it. So like, I I feel like a really important point for me on that path came when somebody passed along to me a couple of books that were written by an Anglican priest um, who basically outlined every single like doubt and question that I had and made it clear that like not only was this not a a reason for being excluded from the life of faith but that there were ways of rationally and spiritually sorting through these questions that um because you know i think that that you can start to wonder whether okay is there like is there really room for me in this life of faith if these are the the things that I believe to be true, if these are the doubts and questions that I have, if I'm calling into question, you know, like you said, things that seem to be on the pages of the Bible, um, just creating that space, I think, within our tradition, for starters, and then that invitation for people who who think the faith isn't for them to to know that um like we're we're a faith that that certainly makes room for inquiring and discerning hearts like <laughs> that and rational minds and like it isn't one or the other i think that's exceptionally important yeah yeah well and and i think the nice thing about where we are today is that we're kind of in a place where you have to do that. Hmm. You know, before you could kind of fudge it, you could get away with it a little bit and say, you know, I think that I think it was a time and a place where you could just say, well, you just have to believe. And I think today we're in a place where that explanation doesn't work as well anymore. Because I think if you just say, just believe it, I think a lot of people will say, no, thanks. So hmm. I do think it's incumbent upon us as faith leaders to say, okay, no, you're right. It's we need to show you how this can work for you, where you have every right to walk away because it's not because there's a lot of reasons to walk away. So I think we have to make the case why it's worth them sticking around personally. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that a big part of the offering of your book is in making that case for why it's worth it to stick around, why there's room at at the table for uh, the rational mind. Um, but then I would say, I don't know, is it like half of the book uh, is devoted then to spiritual practices that um, that take kind of this worldview um, and and then help people on that path to the overview effect that path towards spiritual connection. You have a number of practices that that you outline. Um, you talk about breath, about prayer, about ritual, 
about connection and about beauty. Now, obviously, beauty is pretty important because it made it into the title. So I want to talk about that separately. But maybe you could talk about prayer um, because I found that chapter to be challenging. I also found it to be reassuring. Prayer does matter. It does affect change. What else would you want people to consider about the practice of prayer? So in order to kind of really dive into my perspective on prayer, I think it, it, th- it would be helpful for us just to take a moment to establish my view of how God operates in the universe, because that matters for this. So my understanding of God falls along the lines of what's called pantheism, which essentially means that God is the universe. And so I spend a lot of time in the book fleshing out why I feel this perspective on God. It's consistent with Judaism and our scientific understanding of the world. But let's just for the sake of argument, let's just assume I'm right about that, right? <laughs> just, just, for the, just for the sake of me talking about this. So <clears throat> if God is the universe, what that suggests is that God is not a conscious entity that exists beyond the bounds of space and time. Rather, we are literally living inside of God. And since all matter is God, then you and I and every other human on the planet, literally everything is part of God. Now, this is a fundamentally different way of like understanding what God is, and it has consequences for how we think about prayer. Because normally, the way Christians and other theists pray is that their prayer is designed to deliver a message to God, right? So, we we pray and we send the message with the hopes of inspiring God to act on our behalf. So, for example, and I'm sure you've, you've done this as a pastor, I, I certainly have too, but if someone has cancer— I might pray that God would intervene to heal the cancer. Mm -hmm. But if my perspective on God is being the universe is correct, what that means is God is already present in that person. God can't reach in because God is the cancer cell. Mm -hmm. And that's a hugely different way of kind of thinking about God than the way I think we normally or traditionally would think about it. So what this means is we kind of have to abandon the traditional approach to prayer in favor of uh, a, maybe a, a differing perspective on how we pray. So I basically argue that there's there's two functions to prayer. And, and as you said, it really does matter. Um, and so the first function is what I call overview effect prayer, which is where you pray with the with the desire to experience the overview effect that was spoken about by Edgar Mitchell, that ecstasy of unity. So I use an example in the book of this that I think it really drives it home, which has to do with like Malcolm X. So if you know anything about Malcolm X here in the United States, he very much hated white people for good reason, because, you know, uh, white people had uh, perpetrated violence against black Americans, lynched black Americans. I mean, it was it was very horrible time that he came up in. Uh, the racism was very potent here in the United States. And so he really was against Martin Luther King Jr. He didn't believe in what Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to do. He felt that nonviolence was a very uh, was not the right approach, that ultimately it wasn't going to achieve what they wanted. So this is where he stood. And then he went on his pilgrimage to Mecca. And while he was there, he encountered white Muslims who treated him as an equal. And this was, he had never experienced this before in his life. And they prayed together side by side. Hmm. And he spoke about how this spiritual experience of unconditional love, it completely reoriented his entire way of thinking around the issue of race and prejudice. And he kind of had this, he didn't say it this way because he wouldn't have used this language, but he had an overview effect moment where he caught a glimpse of how we're all connected to each other. and he caught this glimpse of how the barriers that separate us are man-made. And so when he returned to the United States, he actually said he wanted to work alongside Martin Luther King Jr. because now he saw that this nonviolence was a viable path forward and he felt it was the only sensible solution. So I'm going to stop there. That's the first kind of part of prayer. Like that's the first point of prayer, but it's the idea that prayer can allow us under the right circumstances to have this overview effect moment. So I just didn't know if you wanted to talk about that further or uh, if you wanted me to go on to the second one. Yeah, why don't you share the second one? Okay. So um, so the second one, the second part is what, what I refer to as imaginative prayer. And it's basically designed so we can achieve a specific vision for our lives. And the basic idea behind this is that there's evidence to suggest scientifically 
That when humans believe deeply in something beyond themselves, it can transform not just our thinking, but also our biology. So a good example of this uh, that I use in the book and is actually from the New Testament. So uh, we're, most people are familiar with the story of the woman suffering from the 12-year hemorrhage, right? Which we would, you know, today, if that story happened, we would say, oh, she has menorrhagia, which is basically continuous menstruation, which sounds awful. I'm a man and I, and I, and I have no idea what it's like, and it just sounds awful to me. So this woman is really suffering. Mm -hmm. So she's out in the middle of the crowd. She, she has been suffering for so long that she sees Jesus and she thinks to herself, almost in the form of a prayer, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. So she, she reaches out, she touches, barely touches his cloak and immediately her ailment is healed. And when Jesus becomes aware of this, he turns around, he says, who touched my clothes? And she kneels before him. And Jesus says something that's always been very puzzling to me. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now, I distinctly remember the first time I read this, my confusion around this, because you would think that Jesus would say, daughter, I have made mm -hmm. you well. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus is the one doing the healing, right? Mm -hmm. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, I made you well. He says, your faith, your faith has made you well. And so in a sense, he's essentially saying, you're the cause of your own healing. You're the one that did it. Now, why would he do that? Why would he give her the credit? Well, we know that humans have this incredible ability to heal themselves. And we know this today scientifically because of drug studies. So clinical tests of new drugs, you always have what's known as a placebo group, right? And the placebo group, they are given a substance of no medicinal value. So it's a sugar pill or it's, it's colored, you know, if it's a, if it's a drip, it's colored to look like whatever it is everybody else is being given. But what's, and they want to make sure that the medicine is having more than a random effect. But sometimes the people in the placebo group, they get better. They're not taking the drug, but their brain thinks they are, and they end up cured of the ailment. So the placebo effect, it reveals two important secrets about human beings. The first is that the brain is one of the greatest healers we possess, for sure. Mm -hmm. But two, if we want to unlock the healing power of our mind, we require something tangible on which to focus our belief. And so if you look at both examples, uh, like the drug study, the person given the placebo believes so strongly in the healing power of that drug that their mind cures the body of the ailment. In the example of the woman suffering from menorrhagia, the focus of her belief is on Jesus. She believes so strongly that Jesus can heal her that when she touches his clothes, her body makes that healing a reality. And Jesus appears, I mean, from this story, he appears to be aware of the relationship between belief and healing, which is why he gives credit to the woman saying, your faith has healed you. Now, why does that matter? Like what I've taken all this time to explain this to you. Why does it matter? Well, my starting premise is that God is the universe and therefore God, in a sense, cannot intervene to heal you, right? But I don't want people to dismiss the idea that prayer can heal. It absolutely can heal you. Like prayer is such a powerful tool, a spiritual tool that, that we possess. But the way it heals is by enhancing our belief, which in turn changes our minds, which then impacts our biology. So these are the two kind of, I would say, the, the two ways that prayer can go. I define prayer as, uh, you know, overview effect prayer and imaginative prayer. And this is all built into the way that I kind of come out of the science of how we look at God in the book. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would, um, I, I would have some different understandings of prayer from you, but I, I would see those two versions of prayer as actually being quite fundamentally connected to one another, um, and. I would probably argue that the piece around imaginative prayer is not just about tapping into the power of one's own mind, but really about tapping into the the power of the self as part of this wider Absolutely. life and um like incredibly relational universe, right? Like like it isn't just that I heal myself, it's that like I'm I'm part of a, a life and a power and a, um, a, a relationship that is far bigger than just me. 
Oh yeah, and they're not mutually exclusive at all. You know, I'm I'm giving you the kind of like the two sides of them, and but you're absolutely right. They do weave together in a beautiful way. Having an experience of the overview effect via prayer is going to enhance, I think, one's ability to go through imaginative prayer and enhance your belief in the world around you. So um, I would agree completely. I think you're right on target with that, and uh, I think that those two. And in the book, I do take time to talk about how those two things weave together and how important they are with each other. Hmm. Okay. So, um, I, as I was reading your book, I, I just kept coming back to this tremendously relational universe. I mean, that is built into the science, that is built into the stories that you share, and it is built into the spiritual practices that you offer. It's kind of all based on this premise of a tremendously relational universe. Um, That overview effect is about that melting away of boundaries and that sense of unity with with the universe, with everything around us. I I was thinking about some of the writing that I've done around um, our relationship with food and our bodies and my fundamental argument that if we want health in our bodies and if we want health in our relationship with food, we have to come back to this, uh, the relational nature of both our bodies and, and the food that we put into our bodies. Um, in my most recent book, uh, talking about why the church matters, you know, I kind of like fundamentally landed on this quest or on this, um, this conclusion that the church bears witness to how connected we really are to one another. I mean, I, I, because I was writing during the pandemic, I, reflected on how we're actually infected with one another like there's there's no way of living in this universe without sharing water molecules and air molecules and food and uh ecosystems and germs and bacteria a- across all of our bodies right like we're infected with one another um So my question for you is, I was feeling like, as I was reading the book, that there might be other um, spiritual practices that are connected to that relational reality as well, that might be built out from the ones that you offer. And I'm thinking specifically pieces around loving service, around servant ministry, um, I wonder about the place of sacrifice. I wonder about love. Um, you touch on love in the book, but can you just say a little bit more about about that uh, servant ministry, about about sacrifice and about love in spiritual practice? Yeah, I mean, I think that what I've found to be true during my time as a pastor, and I'm sure you would agree with this, is that when I spend my time serving and sacrificing for other people, there's an emptying of myself that I do with that, right? So it's, you know, if you're in the right place, you know, uh, in your mind, body, soul, you know, you're you're kind of, you're emptying a per- portion of who you are to be there for that person. And I'm doing that for the benefit of, of people because uh, I don't want to focus on my needs. I want to focus on the needs of this other person. And so, this emptying can place me in a position where I'm more likely to experience a connection with the humanity of this other person. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but often when I'm in a place of service, I really take a moment and I say, okay, I want to see the world through their eyes. Because oftentimes when you're dealing with people who, who you're serving, they're in kind of a tough place. You know, sometimes, you know, where, where whatever's happened to them, they're struggling. And so I want to make sure that I go into it because I assume, you know, if they're rude to me, I don't want to be reactive. If they're, if they're not, if, you know, if they're not, working with the program of whatever we're doing, I want to make sure that I'm that I'm understanding of that. And so I always try to put myself into their situation and say, okay, what's going on here? And like I'll give you an example. When I when I work with, you know, unhoused people, uh, people who are struggling, you know, with with their daily provisions, I often think to myself, if I was dealing with pangs of hunger all day, 
you know, how would, how would that make me feel? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, how would I go? And usually what that does is it slows me down and I can, and I really try to like connect. And in, and sometimes in that connection, there is this really beautiful experience where sometimes if they're in the right moment too, they, we, there's a connection that happens. And I remember there was a guy who I worked with one time and uh, he would come to this shelter with his mother and uh, he, he had been really mentally wounded in Vietnam. And so he struggled a lot with just kind of doing day-to-day tasks. But I remember when we would sit down and we would talk, you know, he, he actually said to me one time, he's like, it's really nice for the first time in a long time to have a friend. Mm -hmm. And I, and you know, I, I don't know if I would have considered him a friend myself, but I, I made sure to talk to him every single week and give him, you know, to, to be there with him, to be invested in who he was. And no matter how tough he could be, I wanted to be there for him. And so I would say that I've, the, the thinness we talk in the book, I talk about the shell that we have on our bodies and the thicker that shell is the heart the more we're an island separated from everybody else Mm -hmm. the thinner that shell the closer we get and i really agree with you and i and i think it's a great question that you that you pose is does service does does giving does loving other people does that thin the shell a hundred percent it does i i i really believe that those actions are fundamental to us thinning the shell so um and i would love to hear stories about when that's happened for you to be perfectly honest yeah, I mean, when it's happened for me and when it's happened for a lot of the people that I serve with in ministry, right? Like it is one of the great privileges of being a a leader in a church is that you do get to be around a lot of people with thin shells. Like like they have just they've walked the walk of like being people of generosity and service like we have a daily breakfast program here at St. George's and i think it's actually pretty hard to go into that breakfast program and and serve people without having your shell thin <laughs> get thinner because like you just you spend any time at all talking to people who live in such different circumstances from the ones that we just take for granted and you start talking to them and realize like they have wisdom and insight and love and faith and lives of prayer and um and friendship that like i i recognize like i recognize all those things i recognize our shared humanity i recognize like that um how many how many particular accidents or or fortunes have me in one place and them in another place right like um i, I think it's hard to to not walk away from those experiences without a sense of just how fundamentally connected to one another we are i would agree with that i i think that you're bringing up kind of a <clears throat> an interesting aspect of how service is fundamental to kind of what we're called to do. I think particularly in the Christian faith, I mean, a lot of across a lot of religions, it's important, but in Christianity, I mean, Jesus really calls us to do it. And I think that there's this idea that the reason why you do it is just so that, you know, if somebody's hungry, you just want them to eat. Right. But there's something much deeper to it than that. And the more you engage in that, the more you realize, Oh, He's not just asking us to do that to serve a purpose, like that he wants, obviously, us to make sure that everybody has enough, but that there's something fundamentally spiritual about just the practice of that. And and I think that you've you highlighted that so well in what you said. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um now the I, I think that you must have gone through some different iterations of what the title for this book could have been, but you landed on restorative beauty. And that was one of the things that stuck out from our previous conversation. I think we kind of began our interview um, five months ago talking about beauty as a really important part of our spiritual lives and our sense of relationship with God. Um, So can you flesh out for us how you see beauty as a spiritual practice. Absolutely. Well, 
you know, and within the book, I th- you you know, you named all the different practices that I talk about in there. Um, but I think, th- and those are all very well documented. You know, uh, you know, in fact, probably better documented than what I even provide in the book, uh, depending on what you want to read. But uh, beauty is a spiritual practice that I think is less well known. And, uh, and Islam actually, I think is one of the, so Islam is very interesting in the sense that it promotes a belief that beauty is a way to experience the divine. It's in a lot of different, uh, religions, particularly the Abrahamic religions, but, um, and so I'm certainly not the first to discuss it, but I do think that my approach is unique to this. And so there's four types of beauty I talk about in the book, which is, uh, natural beauty, aesthetic beauty, revealed beauty and transcendent beauty. Now, of course, you know, natural beauty, that's the one everybody knows pretty, they're pretty familiar with. You see a, you see, you see a beautiful landscape and, um, they very much feel the, you know, you feel the presence of God reflected in that beauty. I think everybody on some level has probably experienced that one way or another, but I spend a good bit of time in the book talking about how our understanding of beauty is a critical component of the degree to which beauty can facilitate an overview effect moment in our lives. So I kind of talk about how when I was young, my understanding of beauty was actually very narrow. So mm. I talked about how for me, beauty as a teenager in my early 20s was actually confined to human features. Uh, and that that was so if you were going to say something was beautiful, that was a person. It, I never applied it to anything else in my life. But then I met my, my wife and she really expanded my understanding of what could be categorized as beautiful. And uh, for me, she did this, of course, with art. And she she started teaching me about uh, various artists and what it takes to make their work beautiful. So. And I know it might seem strange to say this uh, because some people are probably like, are are you serious? But uh, I never considered artwork to be beautiful. Like Mm. up to that point, beauty was a word that for me, it was only for people. And once, but once you started instructing me on art and showing me all the details of how it all worked together, like that's where I, it just like expanded my whole, it was like, you know, it's like you open this door and you realize like, oh, I've had blinders on this whole time. And you start to see beauty everywhere. And uh, this is when I realized that the human appreciation of beauty, it requires an investment of time that's not unlike other spiritual Mm. practices. So the investment, like, I don't think we often think of it that way. We're just like, you know, I think, I think for some people it's like, well, you just either like beauty or you don't, right? Or you have a certain sense Mm. of beauty or you don't. I actually don't think that's true. I think uh, when you invest, it actually, it, it, it opens more and more doors to what you see as beautiful. So I talk about revealed beauty in the book, which is when you peel back layers of mystery in the universe. And Mm. that's, it's kind of like, as you learn more about the world we inhabit, you start making these connections. And the more knowledge that, that you learn about the world, about the, the inherent beauty of the world, like you start to have these overview effect moments from these connections uh, that you, that you seek. So it's like by studying science and learning about the world, you're learning about the divine. So, so it's kind of like, you know, I know we, they all, they're often pitted against each other, but isn't it interesting that when, you know, if we assume that, you know, the traditional stance is God created the universe, you know, I say God is the universe. So for me, the more I learn about the universe, the more I'm fundamentally learning about God, like mm-hmm. at, at every step along the way. Um, and so then the most profound form of beauty is what I call transcendent beauty, uh, which occurs when all the other forms of beauty, so natural, aesthetic, and revealed, and they come together to generate an overview effect moment. And mm. what I argue in the book is that the that of all the spiritual practices I outline, beauty is the most accessible. Mm. Because in in many ways, I think that it's, you know, it can be hard to learn how to take time to meditate and to it can be hard to take time to pray. You know, the rituals can be hard for people. And even connection right now is really challenging. But yeah, yeah. but you can't, but anybody can take time to appreciate beauty if they simply are willing to invest just a little bit in looking past the world that they see in front of them. Like if you can just see a little bit more, see those details, you can, it can change the way you are. But I think that one of the things that um that I really try to emphasize at the end is that even if it's you know, whatever spiritual practice it is, the most important aspect for a rich spiritual life is the ability to be surprised. I, I cannot emphasize mm. that enough. So you have to be open to new experiences and knowledge 
that could upend your current framework. Um, and I say that at the end of the book, I say, you know, if you're not open to change, then no matter how faithfully you engage these spiritual practices, they're ultimately going to be ineffective. And I, and I don't know if you've seen it, but I see people, there's a lot of people who are very scared to learn new things. You know, uh, they just, they know what they know. They don't want to learn anything else. And that, that's limitation to your ability to be surprised. Spiritual, mm -hmm. like to me, the, and what I've noticed is those overview effect moments occur when I am least expecting it. And if, but if I think that, but if I'm in a place where I'm like, well, I know everything and, and, you know, yeah. nobody can teach me anything else. Well, those moments I think pass me by, you have to be vulnerable to say, I don't know everything. Uh, and maybe I'm going to learn something new and I'm okay with that. Even if it changes everything that I've thought before, I'm okay with learning that. And so when you focus your technique, I think the, th the biggest thing that I can say is that when you focus your technique, whatever it is you're doing, uh, over hundreds of hours, which is kind of like what you have to do. You kind of have to like, even if you're staring at beauty for hundreds of hours, whatever it is you're doing, you're preparing your mind, body, and spirit for when that opportunity comes where the overview effect presents itself. And if you do that, you, you can take advantage of it, but you have to be open to surprise. And I think that's fundamentally when you're talking about something like beauty, once you start to see beauty in the world, that is going to acclimate you to be open to surprise because beauty is found everywhere. And when you find beauty in a place where you least expect it, that's one of the most mm. spiritually important moments. Like those moments are st stick with me for forever when that happens. So I don't know how you feel about those, that idea, but, um, yeah, I mean, I really love those connecting threads between between beauty and vulnerability and learning and surprise. Like, I think that those pieces are really intertwined. And I guess I would say, too, like, from my experience, I would say that openness to beauty for me has been, like, tied not just to that investment of time, but it's been very connected to relationship as well. Like I am much better able to see beauty in surprising places when other people share with me where they see beauty, you know, like, cause I, maybe I just hadn't seen that. I had, I missed it. Like I didn't look at the world in that way. And then when they describe it to me, it's like, oh, like I missed that, but, but now I see it. Right. Like, I, I think that that is so much a part of that beauty journey in my experience too. I would agree. I mean, it's like when my wife kind of sat there. Yeah, down like and your me, wife. Yeah, she showed exactly. me. Exactly. You know, and and I think we, we, but yeah, I, but to that point of surprise, yeah, you have to be open to somebody sitting there and saying, have you ever looked at it this way? And you saying, no, I haven't, as opposed to dismissing yeah. it and saying, well, that's good for you, whatever. And you move on. Like to, tr again, that's putting yourself in their eyes and saying, wow, why is this beautiful to you? And then once you see it, oh, it can change your, change your world. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that vulnerability again. That's that like willingness to not be a finished product. Like it's, yeah. Yeah. It's really important. Okay. Well, thank you for, um, for, that breakdown of, I think, as you say, sort of the the most unique part of your offering in this book. We're going to take a break and then we're going to come back with some rapid fire questions to wrap up. Welcome back to the Future Christian Podcast and our closing rapid fire questions. Now, because Alex, you have previously been on the podcast, you don't get the routine rapid fire questions. You get some specially designed rapid fire questions and I'm going to answer them as well, but we are going to have to, um, I, I feel like each of these questions could lead into its own podcast. So we're both going to have to keep each other in check and uh, try to answer the questions succinctly. And I'm saying that for myself, too, because each one of these uh, things, like I said, I could personally talk about at length. OK, ready? Yep. You're set? Yep. OK. So what is a recent experience of beauty in a movie or a TV show that you have seen? Uh, for me, the movie would have to be The Elephant Whispers. It's a short documentary. It actually won the Academy Award for that uh, in 22, I believe. And uh, it's a beautiful film uh, about 
elef- about basically people who take care of elephants. Uh, and uh, it's it's really wonderful. And I would say TV show, hands down, it's got to be Peaky Blinders. I know people will disagree with that just because it's they they would probably see it as being violent. I think it is such a beautiful, beautiful uh, show. Uh, and uh, I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm going to cheat on answering this question because I'm going to say a book instead of a movie or TV show because I I just don't have anything particularly awesome to offer in terms of what I've been watching lately. (laughs) A lot of guilty pleasures, not a lot of beauty. (laughs) But uh, I read uh, recently a book by Jacqueline Hartman called I Who Have Never Known Men, and it's a sci-fi book about uh, a group of women who find themselves in uh, just extraordinarily challenging and disempowering circumstances. And uh, and it's told from the vantage point of this person who finds pretty incredible ways of, uh, of centering her humanity in these just awful circumstances. So um, that's a, a experience of beauty lately. Okay, a recent experience of beauty in music. Um, well, if you talk about surprise, uh, it would have to be Taylor Swift. Uh, so, oh my gosh, bring it on! <laughs> Tell me about yeah, so, Taylor Swift. So my son loves her and uh, plays her all the time. I had never really known much about her, but um, but man, he plays it. And the more I've, you know, I started to get into her music, and then I started kind of looking at who she was as a person and the things she's been through. And I'm like, wow, this. Uh, yeah, I got to give credit where credit's due, and I love her music and her shows. They are beautiful. They are very, very well done. And so, uh, so I, I'm definitely a fan now. And I was open to surprise. I wasn't closed off to that. And uh, I'm so glad I wasn't because she is such a talented, talented musician. She and songwriter. I mean, yes. just an incredible songwriter. I'm such a Swifty. Um, so I totally co-sign that. But I'm also going to mention two albums from 2023 that I've been spending a lot of time with lately. Sufjan Stevens, uh, just incredible um album the javelin javelin and uh then this really quirky artist named chappelle rowan um who just writes like this in this like singular voice and uh doesn't sound like anybody else and really fun and like kind of challenging lyrics. And uh I lots of people would not consider her music beautiful, but it absolutely um just like the singularity of it makes me uh filled with intrigue and delight so those are two albums <laughs> i've been enjoying lately okay and finally a recent experience of beauty in relationship yes yeah, so right before i left my position We hired a youth pastor, so there had been some transition. And this was a young woman. She's a she's an ordained pastor in the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, She was in my youth group growing up, and so uh, she was hired and brought in uh, like two weeks before I ended my time at the church. And um, it's it's been beautiful because my whole family lights up when they get to spend time with her. Uh, and it's been such a wonderful thing to reconnect with her after all these years of her going to, you know, going to college and seminary and, and then coming out and she is a remarkable pastor. So, uh, so that's been probably one of the most recent beautiful experiences and relationships that I've had. And it's been, it's been a great thing. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, I'll just share that we're a couple of days away from a celebration of new ministry here at our church. We've welcomed a new priest and, uh, kind of a different complement of how we're doing ministry. And, uh, it's absolutely, um, kind of outrageous to me the way that people pour themselves so generously into planning this celebration of of a meal and worship and you know people just like stepping up so generously to to make it a beautiful occasion and a beautiful welcome and i i i find it amazing when all of these people offer these gifts that i don't have and do it with you know such generosity and uh 
and then to see how all of that comes together for a pretty profound celebration. So that's really that's, neat. It sounds wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it kind of brings it full circle back to, I think, um, what you said at the beginning, which is like, my gosh, the experience of being in a community of faith is sort of hard to replicate in any other way other than um, what this is. It's quite a privilege. Absolutely, it is. Well, thank you for having me yeah. on the show. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you for this conversation. Um, we will include in the show notes a link to your book. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about where people can find you? Yeah, so if you go to restorativefaith.org, you can read more about the book there. Uh, there's links to it. And um, like you, I continue to write monthly on uh, my blog and talk about you know all kinds of religious ideas that are floating out in the ether. So... Uh, I look forward to hopefully having future conversations with you. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, we always end our podcast with a word of peace. So Alex, may God's peace be with you. And also with you. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romiglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.